Um, hello, I'm Geoffroy Coupri. Uh, I'm going to talk about parser combinators in Rust. Uh, so, me, I'm, I'm sorry, still a problem with the slide. Okay. So, uh, me, I'm the security guy at Clever Cloud, a French company doing uh, platform as a service hosting, like Heroku, but better, just like that. I also do some consulting. Um, Basically, why are we talking about GNOME, which is that uh, cute parcel combinators library I, I'm doing? Well, it all comes from a small projects that is kind of dear to me. I've worked for a few years uh, for VideoLearn on uh, Windows development and security, reverse engineering, some formats, that kind of stuff. Um, VLC has a big problem. Is that it's the, the, the software that, that should handle all the formats that exist. Like to throw any video, any uh, streaming format, it should work. So it's good, but there's the bad part. We have lots of vulnerabilities. Uh, what's interesting here is that the, the MP4 format, uh, it's one of the most ambiguous formats we, we've seen. Uh, it's very hard to, to write a, uh, a good parser for MP4. At, on the other hand, we have a, a parser for Matroska, the MKV files, which is very big in a lot of uh, files, but nobody seemed to have found uh, any vulnerabilities. Maybe check yourself. Uh, some of these rules can just be found by simple fuzzing. So you, you always find a crash somewhere. The problem is we have to, to write C parser by hand. So that's not something we like. So we need some kind of more practical solution. Uh, what I would like is something that's very safe, efficient enough for streaming, and embeddable in C. Uh, that kind of uh, requirement is important because the, otherwise I would do so just some Haskell. But the runtime with the garbage collector and everything is just too big for what we want to do. So I investigated the Rust language that uh, has been developed by Mozilla. The 1.0 version was released just last week. So hopefully now they will stop uh, breaking the language every two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I've, ne I've been developing NOM since October last year. And uh, at some point, but just Every two weeks, something crashes, and uh, you have to start over. But right now, it's very, very stable. So a few highlights on the features of that language that uh, pushed me to choose it. So basically, they want to, to manage the memory directly in the compiler. Because as a developer, as a C developer, I suck. Uh, I don't know how to, to develop a password correctly. So I make mistakes, and I make memory leaks. and so. I shouldn't write, I shouldn't manage the memory myself. So basically, in Rust, the compiler knows at any point in time who owns a variable and when it should be deallocated. Uh, basically, you, you could write so, some uh, data sharing between, uh, between threads, but it will know which thread owns which variable. You no need for mutaxes or anything like that. So that's quite powerful. Uh, there are other features that are, that are interesting. You can manipulate slices instead of buffers. A slice is just a structure containing a pointer and a length. So maybe I thought, what can we do with, with Rust? Well, we could do some zero copy parsers. Like uh, at the end of the passing, we just have um, pointers to the relevant input, and we don't copy anything anywhere. So that was a big bet. Uh, especially in uh, last October where, when the, the language was not that uh, ready. But, well, I tried. It was cute, it was fun. And here's how, how it looks. So, as we can see, uh, is that big enough? No, no. no. okay. Just... In big in place. There? Yeah, that's better. So, uh, first thing to see, uh, Rust is a language that has generics. So this is good because uh, as you see in the first enumeration, the R result, the, the result of parser, we have down, which contains uh, a part of the remaining input and the output type. Uh, most of the time we manipulate byte arrays, but we can manipulate anything. 
Uh, I go after on the error and the need incomplete part, but basically we have we need to, a way to represent correctly errors, and we need to represent incomplete data because sometimes just a parser knows that it must have must more data. So how do you write a parser? It gets a bit hairy. Basically, uh, what we can see at the apostrophe A indicates the lifetime. This is really powerful because you see that the output data has the same lifetime as the input data. That's how I can make sure that data is not copied and it's just a reference to the input. Uh, what do we have on the other side? So we can return errors and everything and you see the return done, uh, ampersand, etc. This is where I take just uh, a slice of the input data and return it. I never copy anything. But it's kind of hard to write. So there's another feature that's really cool in Rust called the macros uh, that I started to use because it makes the parser a bit easier to, to write. Basically, I have the name uh, macro to define a function, and then it's just, just a, a chain of combinators. So here we have a simple one, but we have kind of bigger ones, like uh, uh, we have the map rest, which can take the result of the first parser and apply a function on it. Uh, we have the chain to accumulate pa parser results and pass them in the closure. So we can write some quite complex code very easily with those macros. We have the usual combinators, uh, usual, usual parsers. Uh, some friends just push, uh, contributed the begin then sign parsers uh, just yesterday. So I didn't have to write that. Cool. And with that, with a language that has those kind of features, uh, we can get some interesting performance. So uh, if you have seen the, the paper, it's just, I didn't write this to, to see, A, hey, uh, NOM is the fastest parser ever. No, it's just to see where I was and also to check what it was on the usability part. Uh, basically, Hammer and Gnome was, were a bit hard to write. So that's why I started to, to work on usability and ma macros and everything. Atoparsec and Serial, which are written in Haskell, were just so easy to, co to, to write and to understand and quite fast too. So that, that's quite interesting because at some point, we would like to choose easier to read instead of fast, and maybe optimize it afterwards. Uh, basically, the autoparsec and serial parser are just one or two lines different, nothing like that. And that's one of the biggest goals of my project. I want to make everything easier for the developer. Because there's not only parsing, there's all, all the handling, the streaming, and everything. Like, I presented the incomplete uh, part in the enum. Uh, is, is it still readable? Yeah, maybe. Just one more step. Yeah. Right. I don't know. Okay. So, incomplete is interesting because uh, sometimes you just want to, to tell, okay, I just need more data to, to understand the input. Because uh, with um, the, the, the streaming RTP format or MP4, like this kind of stuff, uh, you know more data will be able to come. So what we do after that, well, we have to handle streaming and then it's not readable anymore. I'm sorry, there's a lot of code. Um, here's a pattern that I made easier for the developer because once you have the incomplete, you can get all the plumbing to pass the data as it comes. The producer, he's, he's, he's just, some kind of uh, piece of data, the data comes like you're handling a file and goes all around the file, or you get data from a socket. The producer will, will handle passing the data to your parsers. If it gets incomplete, it will reallocate a buffer with the preceding input, add more inputs, try again, and all of this in automati automatically. But it's not enough. We need something more powerful. So we have the, sorry, the, we have the consumers. The consumer is a bigger pattern. Basically, it's uh, the other end, and it's the state machine. You implement something that will get a producer and ask data, ask, okay, I, I await 10 bytes, or I need to seek back in the input, or seek, need to seek uh, in the other end. 
So you can do that. We have the, um, the plumbing for that. And basically, you, you will define your state, your parsers, and you write your state machine like that. Uh, so as an aside, um, this is a switch-based state machine. We all know that it's a very, very bad idea. Uh, I tried to play a bit with uh, type and force state machines in Rust. It's cute, it's fun to use, but basically, we, that's uh, what uh, Eric was saying. Uh, we, we need input enabled state machines, so we need to have any message to come at uh, any state. So that kind of state machine is not good. I should find a way to generate them for runtime uh, checking. So I made it easier to, to handle streaming and that kind of pattern, but we can do better for the developer because uh, the passer has, has fun to write, but sometimes when you don't, don't know what works, you, you have to, to do a bit of, of guessing. So for the debugging part, I tried to add some tools that could make it fun to, to, write, to write parsers. So let, let's use a first tool that we all know, the xdump. So that's easy, you take a file, you put it in xdump and it works. Well, why shouldn't I be able to, to do that on a parser that I have in memory, or on a, parser, on a buffer? Basically, I see that I had an error with, uh, with one, one parser, I get its slice, and uh, I do a hexdump. This is the, the easiest one. Uh, I have the debug and debug dump macros. Basically, if the child parser uh, returns an error, it prints the error. And the debug dump will also print uh, the hex dump of the, the input slice. Uh, but it's not enough. We can do better for error man management. So this, this is why I have some complicated types. At the beginning, in norm, the, the error was just, uh, just an error code and nothing more. Here we have uh, the, the ability to, to, to show error codes, position in the input, and a pointer to the, the, the next error. What can we do wi with that? Well, we have the, her the, the error macro. So the, this macro is kind of like the, the cut operator in, uh, in Prolog. Basically, uh, the problem we have uh, with parser combinators is that if there's an error, it will backtrack and try another one and backtrack, backtrack, and the parser that will return an error is the, the root one. And it gives you zero information on the parsing. So with the, that kind of macro, uh, you can just return an error in a, where, where it should have. You return the error you, you needed to see. Because basically it will not backtrack, it will just do an error return. Uh, there's another trick in there is that if in the chain of child parsers there's another error macro, it will catch that error return, wrap it, add its own, and return. So that's how we have a chain of error that can be uh, generated. Like, uh, I don't know if we see, uh, we can have a, a better one. So here we see that we have a few errors that, that have embedded in uh, each other. What can we do with that? Uh, the first thing we can do is pattern match. Basically, we take the, the a chain of error codes and try to, to, to get error message from that. There's a problem with this. Uh, pattern matching will break if the grammar changes. So there's a nice paper that we, you will see that's called MER. Uh, that's a neural management system that came for, for many years in the OCaml parsers. Basically, the idea is that you generate error patterns from known bad inputs, and you use that uh, as the, the error management system. So here I take some bad inputs that I know, I get the error that uh, that returns. I use that as a hatch map. Uh, if I get a list of error codes, I know directly the, the good error code. And a last fun feature that we can do with the, the chain of errors is this. We can see which part of the input in the xdump uh, is handled. So uh, there's a problem with that is that it's a chain, it's a path in the parser, st the parser tree. So we, we do not see uh, contiguous parsers, but we see just parent, child, 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 child. But it's quite cool. Uh, I have to say it's, it's very, it was very fun to, to develop and it's quite cool to use. So is it usable enough? 
Well, I'd say yes, because people are using it. Uh, oh, then it's too big. So uh, basically, the any GIF and MP4 were mine, uh, because I, have, I had to try it. But uh, some guy that did the fast queue, which is a text format for encoding uh, genetic data, uh, libconfig, uh, Swift and Kafka for messaging format, some IRC one. And also a small uh, company that you may know that has used the uh, norm uh, for some time. So uh, some guy contacted me a few months ago. Hey, we do uh, streaming HTTP parsing with norm, uh, and uh, it's quite fast. All right. So to sum up, we have a language and a, a parser library that is fast, that is memory safe, that has no runtime cost, no garbage collection, nothing like that, that can be embedded in C and made sure it works, and has a lot of tooling for developers. So this is not very formal, but this is what developers like, something that is easy to use as tooling that is, makes the, the development more uh, interactive. So you have the, the GitHub uh, URL. Uh, I can take a question if you need. Thank you. Could you go back just one slide? Yeah. Yep. Um, well, questions, right? Uh, truly a ray of hope. Right, uh, especially I was especially glad to see the usage slide, yep. uh, and then know the story. Um, questions? No Rust programmers here. Yeah. Well, maybe after this day, I certainly do know that I'm going to uh, uh, try to write something in this um, language. I guess I have one question. So I. I'm using Rust in one of my classes on programming languages for grad students, and uh, you know, I was had it. I was looking around for a parser, but do you think it's ready, to the, you know, enough for grad students to use at this point, or do they? Ha how much of a background does a student have to have to use your library? Um, it's quite hard to get a lot of concepts. In the most important about the, the memory, because the 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 compiler is just too smart, and sometimes you don't understand what. What he means, like the, there's some weird memory error that can happen, but it's not self-evident, and uh, for for a beginner it can be hard sometimes. But basically, it gets smarter and smarter, and uh, makes it easier too. Okay, thank you. So I have a question. Uh, have you looked at? Uh, uh, data structures that uh, SSL TLS uses? Uh, yes, I'm not confident in uh, writing a TLS parser right now. Uh, it may be doable, but uh, ba basically uh, I can handle almost any uh, binary uh, format right now. Mm -hmm. um, so how deeply nested uh, are uh, the formats that you have parsed to date? Uh, well, the GIF one, uh, when you try to get the, the image data, it's on a bit stream, not a byte mm -hmm. stream. So, but that's not uh, byte aligned. So you have some time to get three bytes from the preceding three bits from the preceding byte, and that's quite annoying. Uh, the MP4 format is very, very amb ambiguous, because uh, while there's uh, some, some atom that has a, a tag indica indicating the length, and then another tag that indicates if, it's, if it uses 32 or 64 bit integers, so that changes length, and uh, the, you can have nesting, uh, nested atoms. That's quite hard to write, even with uh, parser combinators. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have to introduce any new kind of combinators? Mm, new ones, uh, I don't know. Um, ba basically, most of the ones uh, I use uh, are already known. Uh, the, the error one was quite different because it can accumulate errors, but uh, the other ones are quite classic, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you.